Thank you so much for having me. I'm really honored to be here. And I want to begin by giving thanks to the people whose land this is and uh, Yakoke Chicana. So, um, I, I'm also going to start by saying, uh, again, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for coming, and thank you all for coming. Uh, I was wondering if someone could shut that door so the energy will kind of stay within the room I'm going to try to create with my talk today. Um, I want to start by at least giving you kind of a introduction to some of the mounds, and I'm going to be talking about mounds today. This is a picture of the new, one of the newest mounds in Oklahoma, uh, Choctaw people, Southeastern um, Indian people from the lower Mississippi Valley, all of us are mound builders. Well, what we found, at least that's what we've been talking about, but what we found indeed is that mounds are all across native North and South America, and we're reading about new mound builders all the time. So this picture was taken when Monique and I were in um, Sulphur. This is one of the pictures. I want to bring your attention to this. Besides building a new mound, this is always present at our dance grounds. Um, it's a gar. And gar are about, the garfish family are about 220. 252 million years old and they're uh, thought to just represent life not on a continuum but just life itself so they always are on top of our our dance dance grounds that are located close to one of the mounds so um, we've been on a mound crawl for about Monique and I about two years to the two years so we visited mounds uh, almost three years we're fixing to do a little bit more uh, this is a mound of view of the portion of the wing of bird mound that I'm going to be talking about uh, at Poverty Point this is just one side of her wings uh, it's a ginormous seven story tall um, ancient mound in fact it's probably the oldest of its kind um, in the Western Hemisphere. It's about uh, 4,500 years old, and there's a ball ground, ball grounds very close, but I'll, I'm gonna continue to talk about that, but that's one picture. You cannot see the expanse of this uh, bird uh, really on the ground. You need to be up, up very high in, from a plane to see the entirety of it. Um, I'm also going to be talking about the invention of baseball and ball games. And here is from a picture on the mound at uh, the Choctaw Nation. She's just in holding on to uh, life there, the ball. Um, and so at our sites, there are 11 tribal tournaments in Oklahoma today. They're fast pitch tournaments, which are underhanded and, of course, Baseball began as an underhanded game, and they didn't change the way they threw the ball until uh, 1893, I think. Now, this is from Ontario, Canada. We were there last year, 2012, sorry, 2012, summer of 12. Jill and Monique and I were there, along with the other members of our team. This is a partial view of the Serpent Man. The interesting thing in our research is that we notice that there's an alignment with the serpent mound in Ohio. So um, this is something that we, we, I didn't know, certainly, we didn't know. But it's a beautiful, beautiful site if you haven't been. How many of you have been to that mound site? It's beautiful. It's extraordinary. It's very close. It's about 35, 40 minutes from here. <clears throat> And this is Gadua, a mother mound, right over in this corner. It's hard to see because it's very large. It's a gentle rise. Um, it's the mother mound in Cherokee, North Carolina. 
This is the Choctaw Mound. It's also our mother mound, Naniwaya. It's a ginormous uh, earthwork. And um, I can talk a little bit. It's about 2,500 years old. And right from where I shot that picture is the swamp. And so I think it's an engineering feat at some point to talk about how those mounds were built so that they would last surrounded by swamp lands. A lot of that land, <coughs> hence, has been platted, but for the most part, it's still, the cypress knees are still all around our mother mound. Um, and what the Choctaws took was pieces of earth that they sewed into their clothes when they were removed from um, Mississippi, what is now Mississippi. And so that's just back to this new mound that's built in uh, the Ch Chickasaws have built this at their cultural center. Um, there's also one other huge mound that's built in Oklahoma now um, by an intertribal group. It's set along the Canadian River and it's built in a spiral. It's absolutely beautiful and I'm sorry that I didn't have a picture of it. So that's just a little bit about what the slideshow is and we're hoping that they will click on their own as I'm talking. So, okay, I'm gonna move that a little bit. Isa Halali Ha Toka Iksa Ilia Ishashki. Because you are holding on to me, I am not dead yet. Isa Halali Ha Toka Iksa Iliok Ishashki. Because you are holding on to me, I am not dead yet. Isa halali ha toka iksa ilia ishashki. Because you're holding on to me, I am not dead yet. If praxis is any indicator of tradition, the line may have been a call and response song chant used by generation of Choctaws in the lower Mississippi Valley before these, this line was captured and assimilated by Presbyterian missionaries in 1820 into a static so-called Christianized hymn. Today, the song chant is published in the Choctaw Hymnal by the Presbyterians, but it is in the section called a traditional song and said to be an evening chant. Hmm. As anthropologist James Howard has said, most Choctaw dance songs feature call and response. Isa halali ha toka iksa iliak ishashki. Because you are holding on to me, I am not dead yet. It should also be noted that traditional or older forms of Choctaw song chants relied on just one or two lines of phrasing for the entirety of the performance with inter interlocking hmm, 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 hmm. Yet, I believe there's something else to be teased out of the lines. Translation, in the oral tradition, second person has a visual appeal in order to appreciate the nature of what is being shown in the speech. In the case of Isa Halali Ha Toka Iksa Iliok Ishashki, who is calling, who is responding, and what is being shown? I'll try to give an answer to this question at the end of my long talk about mound building, the invention of base and ball, which becomes baseball, or at least the root game of it, and how games are embodied in Southeastern natives' physical actions and passed down for thousands of years, championing the survival and thrivance of Choctaws. Embodied tribalography first installation. Now I return with a renewed sense of wonder to, to Daganawea and Iowantha, the remarkable two-man team that united warring tribes into the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. In writing the story of America, a tribalography, I was originally struck by the fact that Daganawea and Iowantha's travels across Northeast change the world for the Haudenosaunee and their story of unification influencing the founding fathers of the U.S. or so-called founding fathers and how they united the 13 colonies. But what is missing from the story of America is a discussion of the reciprocal embodiment between people and land as part and parcel 
of a tribalography. For example, if Daganawea and Iawantha were the embodiment of the land's desire for peace, of the land's desire for peace expressed through their physical actions, and I think they were, how might embodiment be expressed in other lands by other tribal peoples? So perhaps looking to my own tribe's confederacy, the Choctaw Confederacy, and our praxis, e.g. ball game, for survival and play, and linking that to Earthworks physical actions expressed through the body's language just might be a good place to start. Um, as anthropologist Brenda Farnell has said, once persons are conceived as embodied agents empowered to perform signifying acts with both speech and action sign, the way is clear to see the medium of movement as an equally available resource for making meaning. That is, all languages, whether expressed by the body or speech, are meaning-making that can also be imaginative and metaphorical. In other words, our own bodies and the tribal body, our nations, express the language of ceremony that is the map of our survivance. In ferreting out these connections, I considered many factors and sources. The earthworks where ancient games took place that I've already talked about, the, the mounds, the stylized iconography of the southeastern ceremonial complex found at Mississippian sites where all Choctaws are descendant of the Mississippians, historical documents, oral traditions, and the way contemporary native communities continue to play in tribal tournaments. I also reflect on the motion of water and wind in the northern Hemisphere. This may explain why natives in the southeast dance counterclockwise. Uh, unlike many northern, more northern uh, tribes, we dance counterclockwise, just like our winds and tornado winds are counterclockwise. We also mimic the water flow. Tornadoes and hurricane winds in the southeast are all counter sun. Further, the game is without limits. There are no time limits in our games. Evoke any, and we also evoke the four cardinal directions, and most importantly, base and ball is an egalitarian game that anyone can play with a ball and a stick. So I want to state right up front that while the manifestation of baseball expresses southeastern indigenous life ways, running the four directions counterclockwise, imposing no time limits, having a pitcher at the center of play, much like the Choctaw ceremonial center pole, Itifabusa, which unites all three worlds, up and down, upper world, middle world, lower world. I'm not suggesting that the Americans stole baseball from Indians. Rather, I'm saying that if the land taught natives how to embody ball game, it might also have taught non-natives as well. So I'm going to tell a story about how our relations played ball. While some baseball historians track the origin of baseball to everywhere but native North America, indigenous people can point to the ancient ball field situated next to the earthwork site throughout the western and northern hemisphere. The fields of geometric shapes in the Americas suggest indigenous people were playing ball games adjacent to mound sites at the same time it was simultaneous to their construction. There are also ancient stories our ancient stories of how the animals and birds taught us how to play ball. And so the following is a bit of a compilation and I'll skip parts of it because it's very long. A long time ago, the animals char uh, challenged the birds to a great ball game and the birds accepted. How many of you know that story? The animals and birds taught us to play ball. The captain of the animal team was bare and he was very strong. He could play all day and never get tired. All the way to the ball ground, ball, Bear was throwing logs and boasting how the animals would win this game. 
The birds had Eagle for a captain and the co-captain was Hawk. They were very fast and could carry the ball and fly it home to score the points. Everyone knew the birds were fast and powerful ball players. Before the big game, the animals and birds had an all-night dance, which is something we still do. We have all-night dance before our big games that start at these tribal tournaments. At that dance, a few of the little ones came along and said they wanted to participate on the teams. Because they were so small, no one wanted them. Finally, Eagle took pity on the little ones and decided to make wings for the little ones so they could play the game. Eagle took a piece of leather from the drum and put it on back to make him wings. Next, he stretched the fur of Squirrel to make him wings. Each of the little ones had a different way of fitting into our ball game. On the day of the big game, the little ones would prove the effort to give them wings was worth it. The two teams, animals and blur birds, played all day. They played all night, and the game went on and on and on, just like our tribal tournaments. Finally, after many days and nights when Bear and Eagle were exhausted, it was Bat who carried the ball and threw it to score the winning point. For his hard work and humbleness, Bat was thought to be important to both animals and birds, so today he can play on both teams. The story of animals and birds has thought to be about the southeastern um, game Tolly or stickball, but I suggest there may be a deeper meaning intended for listeners. The animals and birds agreed to play ball game, but they do, do not carry sticks to use the game. There are no sticks mentioned in this game and in this story about the game. Just before the big game, they host a party, an all-night stance, Out, outsiders, and this is key to southeastern epistemologies, outsiders show up, but they might be small and puny, uh, since we're, we're thought to be the people. <clears throat> um, that's a joke, y'all. <laughs> Eagle, the most gifted leader of the birds, offers them a spot on the team, but they must be out fitted appropriately for bats. Special wings are made and squirrel's fur is reshaped. In other words, bat and flying squirrel's new regalia make them proper for play on the birds team. So after a long, tiring game, they, they, they're the ones who help win the game. Here I'm interested in the story elements that deal with the body and the physical movement. The story is one really if we pull the story apart to see its elements, it's a story of trans transformation from one form into another form, from movement in two worlds, upper and middle world. The transformation of both bat and squirrel are re the result of their desire to play in the ball game. The evolution of their bodies occurs quickly. They suddenly embody new physical attributes but they must also remember how to move in their non-transformed selves, occupying both worlds in order to play the game. Even more profound, indigenous southeastern storytellers have always mapped squirrel and bat together in the ballgame story, often substituting one animal for the other. So it should come as no surprise that scientists now suggest that 55 million years ago, bat and squirrel shared an arboreal, squirrel-like gliding ancestor, underscoring a core southeastern belief that everything, everything is related to everything. Other aspects of the story point to lessons native, natives, humans must embody, such as generosity and hospitality. Ego offers the little ones a place on his team. The subtext, never, never, never underestimate those you think are less fortunate, for they may play harder for your team, read tribe, than your own kind. The story teaches us that dance is a ceremonial event and integral to our, 
our biggest events, a cultural life way that still we maintain after all of these centuries today. The story encourages natives to perfect our bodies in order to attain a larger goal as squirrel and bat did. While animals and birds story teaches natives to play ball game, we must remember the game is unspecified and could mean any number of indigenous ball games that we still play today. Finally, natives learn through the story that we're capable of embodying, we're capable of embodying the knowledge of animals and birds. What else can we infer from this story? It's not a story of warfare. No one is killed during play. No horrendous fights take place after the game. At least we've, it's not part of the story and we've never been told that. The birds and animals also show us how to make fictive kin with people and things read systems, people and systems different from ourselves. This is also something that the Iroquois Confederates condolence ceremony teaches. In the historic southeast there are many examples of Choctaw fictive kin traveling on diplomatic missions on behalf of our tribe. Fictive kin is a term used by scholars to describe kinship that is either neither blood nor from marriage. The Choctaws have a very old and prominent Fanny Mingo or Fanny Miko squirrel chief, that's the translation, institution that serves as a kind of cultural template for diplomacy. Fanny Miko, often adopted as an outsider, must play or must be on our team and, and be as committed to us as he is to his own home team or home tribe. This is also why their kinship net networks in the southeastern tribes are so intertwined, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. In other words, Fanny Miko must advocate for the tribe or town he is not a member of. As Patricia, historian Patricia Galloway points out, these first explorers found native institutions in place for dealing with formal intertribal communities. In the early 18th century, the Fanny Miko institutions served this purpose among the Chickasaw and Choctaws. Tribes would adopt an advocate within a neighboring tribe, and his duty, or her duty, would be to argue in favor of what became, in a sense, his adopted tribe whenever war threatened to break out. Under other names, such an institution may have been widespread as a means of dealing with intertribal relations throughout the Southeast, connected with the fictive kin me mechanisms of the Calumet ceremony. The story of animals and birds shows us how to make diplomatic relations with other tribes and foreigners, those different from ourselves, that will aid in our survival. Mounds as storied bodies. Since 2011, I've been on the team of playwrights and theater scholars working on a research project, Indigenous Knowledge Contemporary Forma Performance. And um, two of my colleagues are sitting in the room who are part of this, this um, four-year project? It's a four-year project which involves developing new indigenous performance models based dramaturgically on indigenous cultural text, mounds. The Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada awarded the project to a group of us. In this project, we're thinking um, and investigating the language of mounds, and we hope um, it creates a deep structure, knowledge of the deep structure of earthworks as a dramaturgical model. Mounds were built, uh, let's see, these mounds, what they have in common are that they are layered and built by different kinds of soils, one upon the other, and so in our play, Soil layering will be represented in the stories we layer together. As I have written in other essays, we began our research at mound sites by asking questions. Do natives embody their, their tribal lands? How do we embody our tribal lands? 
Do we embody the language of our lands? And I, I think we do. So in our project, we visited mound sites from Canada to Louisiana. They vary in ages from the archaic, early woodland, middle woodland, and late woodland Mississippian periods. In the southeast, some of the great mound cities are Poverty Point in Louisiana, Moundville, Alabama, Naniwaya in Mississippi, and Old Mulgee in Georgia. These are huge earthwork cities and trade sites, um, many of them well over two to 3,000 years old. And they all have ball fields, geometric ball fields that you can see now from the GPSing that is done and from satellite, photograph satellite photography. Uh, I'll come to that, come back to that. Um, other earthworks are known as the Hopewell era sites are located across Ohio and the Ohio Valley. At one time, hundreds of thousands of mounds, including embankments, conical mounds, platform mounds, effigy mounds, dotted indigenous North America, beginning as early as 4,000 before the 4,000 years before the Common Era. The very name Turtle Island connotes a vast effigy mound rising out of the water. In studying these mounds as indigenous literatures, we ask a second question. Are earthworks embodied mnemonics aligned with moon and sun rotations to show future generations of natives when and where to converge at specific sites? Consider, for example, the Newark Earthworks site in Ohio, which is the largest surviving Hopewell complex. One of its mounds, the Octo Octagon Earthworks, comprises a type of lunar observatory for tracking the motions of the moon, <clears throat> including the northernmost point of an 18.6 year cycle of lunar orbit. The moon then rises one half a degree of the octagon's exact center. Today, an 18 year lunar cycle of return continues to be marked in ceremony by natives and non-natives wishing to witness the moon rise but most often they must stand outside the octagon earthworks which lie within a privately held golf course. And they won't let natives on the site. So you have to stand outside the site. It's a, we can talk a little bit more about that, but it's a, it's, a very, um, it's a very sad and serious relationship that something that old, something built by our collective ancestors is they won't let us into that site to witness it from the octagon itself. In ancient times, what kinds of community activities would indigenous people have developed to complement that lunar return? And I answer that with ball games. Consider the bird mound at Poverty Point, Louisiana, one of the major earthwork sites that Monique and I visited. Located in West Carroll Parish, Louisiana, and 15 miles from the Mississippi River on the Macon Bayou, Poverty Point is one of the Western Hemisphere's largest earthworks and is relatively close to the Choctaw's mother mound, Naniwaya, only 197 miles away. Now, our mound, Naniwaya, was, bi was built at least 2,000 years later, but they're still on a, um, a continuum. Poverty Point was built during the late Archaic period and is home to the 3,600-year-old bird mound, of which the wing keeps cycling back. Bird mound came into being, I suggest, a possible explanation as to why the mound was built in such a short period of time and what it may signify is a, a hawk, a red-tailed hawk. Natives at Poverty Point used all the means available to them from the sacred to the scientific. Astronomers, mathematicians, geologists, engineers, storytellers, the young and the old, all came together to create the mound in approximately three months. They came together to create this huge seven-story site, some 238,000 cubic meters of earth was moved in approximately three months, 90 days, to create the story, to create the story of the bird mound. Let's pause for a second. 
natives built this mound that can't be seen. It's so large, you can't see the entirety of it except from the air. What would, be, what would have been the significance of 90 days to these people that they would demand such labor of themselves? The bird mound faces west and her wings seem tilted downward as if landing. Her head may have been tilted to one side, but it's impossible to know as her head has been dug away by 19th century looters looking for gold. However, the angle of the wings could signify that she's moving to perch in order to be mounted by a mate or she's moving to roost. The giant bird mound earthwork has a wingspan of 640 feet and stands seven stories tall. Considering the size of the effigy, it seems likely that she is a bird of prey, a red-tailed hawk. Red-tailed hawks embody special meaning for southeastern natives, especially the Choctaws. That's our signatory symbol of power. The red-tailed hawk is a solar bird, one of power and strength, and the tail feathers are bright red in sunlight. And red signifies to Choctaw's lifeblood, and it's the color of one of our moities, and it's sometimes a powerful metaphor for war. Red-tailed hawks mate over a period of just a few days in late winter or early spring. By March, the female lays her eggs one every other day, so two eggs will make up will take up to four days. The incubation period for hawk eggs is, a, is typically 35 days. It generally takes another four days for the small nestlings to hatch out of their shells. Once out of their shells, the nestlings will spend up to 46 days in the nest before the babies begin to leave on short flights. The total time needed to create a red tail hawk from mating to fledgling, leaving the nest, is approximately 90 days, three months, three months. Therefore, it seems likely that bird mound at Poverty Point is possibly a performance mound that embodies the story of the red-tailed hawk from birth to first flight. The story is one of creation. I suspect that the people who came together from many distances to write that story of Bird Mound into the land must have considered her an important symbol for their communities. And that importance continues to this day. And yet, there's more to the story. Bird Mound signifies two major ceremonial events. March 21st, the vernal equinox, and June 21st, the summer solstice. And it may also be read as a mnemonic expression of return to home base, the subtext of a native ball game. We're always returning home in ball game. If a red-tailed hawk's eggs were laid in March, the fledglings would be ready to leave the nest sometime in late June, close to the time of summer solstice. Traditionally, Choctaws and other southeastern tribes extinguish all fires on the summer solstice, known as Luak Masholi. Fires being a multi-purpose metaphor for setting, settling all scores, ending the old six-month cycle, and beginning our new six-month cycle that will end in winter solstice. The ceremonial cycles are not only the, not the only functions of bird mound, but again, if we connect the gestation of an actual bird, our hawk, with the building of bird's mound, a performance of natural and cosmic events begins to unfold at this site. We can see the ceremony at work. The mound rises above the horizon and spreads its wings, a story to be read over and over for all to revisit that site. Bird Mound faces west, perhaps a metaphor written in the land to mean roost, roosting, roosting time, Isa halali ha toka, Iksa iliok ishashki. Because you are holding on to me, I am not dead yet. The people are singing to the land, I am not dead yet. Because you're holding on to me, I am not dead yet. So the song chant represents a symbiosis between land and people, our mounds. Ancient replications of ball fields 
figure in all of our gorgets, these big gorgets that we wear. One style, the Cox Mound Gorget, found in both Tennessee and Alabama, has four engraved woodpecker heads facing counterclockwise around a large square ground. They're flying, they're flying in counterclockwise. As been previously discussed, native ball game is played counterclockwise on a geometric shaped ball field. Our dances are performed counterclockwise. Therefore, the cross within a circle in these ancient icons may encompass both ball field moti motifs and ceremonial dances and mound and mounds. The engraving may also replicate the wind and water systems that move counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere. According to anthropologists F. Kent Riley, the people of earth and sky visualizing the sacred and Native American art of the Mississippian period, the Native's universe of the Mississippi had stories about all three mythic zones. Riley's interpretations relies on the research of excavated artworks found at southeastern Mississippian era sites. The native, quote, the Native American universe of the Mississippian period in which ideological as well as historical action occurred was a three-level configuration composed of the above world, overworld, the middle world, and the beneath world, or the underworld. <clears throat> The story, Riley goes on to say that the story of the center pole that unites all three places at once is represented in the pitcher or the pole man who's standing at the center of the mound. Another important aspect of Poverty Point was trade. According to archaeologist John Gibson, long distance trade was a hallmark of Poverty Point culture. And I want to say something for all of us who have gone to traditional events within our cultures, um, whether it be powwow or shaking shells or, in our case, ball games and, and dances, um, you know from being there that trade happens, trade selling and buying and, and exchanging gifts happens from long distances. We usually have, we've had teams that come down from Canada teams from as far as California that come into Tushkahoma, our ball fields, to play games. What else happens at these, at these events are marriages. So families, because we play all night and play all day and our ball fields are ongoing and the tournament has usually 20 to 30 teams, people come and camp, they bring their trade goods, and they also meet each other. So I made a film in 2006 about uh, playing ball and I was following a girls team, a Choctaw girls team and I said we want to come in and film y'all at night and hang out with y'all in your tents at night and they said uh-uh, uh -uh. <laughs> no you're not, you're not going to do that and I said well it, we, we won't interfere and someone pulled me aside and said this is how we get boyfriends you just stay away, and because uh, we, you know, and sure enough, a couple of the teams that we had been following for the film, um, the two of the people got married. Well, they were related to a bunch of different people, so they had their marriage. They've had children since the film was made and everything, and I just thought it was really funny that, duh, I was so out of it that I didn't realize, oh, yeah, that's how kinship forms between all these different tribes and these tribal families. They come together. There'll be 100,000 people at Tushkahoma. And Indians from all over the country come. They meet, fall in love. Pretty soon you have connections all across Native North America. So I guess um, I will close by saying um, after we were removed, I, I'll tell that story too. So our, our culture survived and thrived for two or 3,000 years in the lower Mississippi Valley. And we were removed, as most of you know, in 1831. 
we removed from what was Mississippi, Alabama, parts of Louisiana, those are all Choctaw peoples, into Oklahoma. And it was a really, really sad time. Um, another game came into being, which is and more prominent, I think, because it's a war game. Um, is stickball. It's a kind of a violent game. And stickball is still played today, but not, but not as often actually as base and ball or ball game and fast pitch, what, what is the original roots of the game of baseball. And during that growth period of time, we were down to something like, oh, I think, 18,000 people total, and we are a big, very big tribe, and we've recovered some of that. But in 2011, the Chickasaw Nation, where I live in the Chickasaw Nation, boasts a population of 49,000 Chickasaws. Now, they were down to about 4,000 people um, after removal, maybe less. We were, I've always been a bigger tribe, but in 2011, the Chickasaw Nation hosts a ball tournament. Um, they report that their operations include 17 casinos, eight smoke shops, a chocolate factory, which is also fantastic, and it's in my town, several museums, a publishing house, and a host of other businesses with a combined annual tribal economic impact of $13 billion. The Choctaw Nation's website uh, reports that the tribe employs 7,600 tribal and non-tribal Oklahomans. Their overall population from our, from our from, for our tribe is some 223,279 Choctaws worldwide. You compare that to the paltry population of 18,000 after removal. And um, obviously the Trail of Tears era the diseases, the boarding schools, the malnutrition took its effect. But I like to think that because of these traditions of always getting together and playing ball, that we grew our people back through these games. And at Tushkahoma, which is our first tribal headquarters, we built a ginormous um, tribal council house. It's three stories tall. Instead of building a mound, we built a big multi-story building in 1896 that's still there today. So we still return to that original site. Um, certainly our place names and our, our life ways continue in Oklahoma. Uh, it, another thing I just wanted to add in wrapping up, it, I interviewed a lot, I, I made a film about bass and ball in 2006, but I also interviewed mainstream Oklahomans about the tribal tournaments, of which I said there are 11, and sometimes there are as many as 13. And most mainstream Oklahomans that I interviewed had never heard of our tribal tournaments, they never heard of our baseball, they never heard that we had mounds, and that was in 2006, never heard of it. Couldn't tell you that it went on, but yet we are everlasting. Here in all the telling and retelling, I've tried to move across space and time, reflecting on how our tribal people embody land and stories. In the process, I found my own distant ancestors, my mothers, my uncles. My uncles played ball. Isa Halaliha Toka. Iksa Iliak Ishashki. Because you are holding on to me. I am not dead yet. And with that chant, I am not dead, we continue, we are life everlasting. We are always in ceremony, especially at our homelands. Thank you. <laughs>